Thank you so much for speaking to us today, Neil, from across the ditch in New Zealand. Now, I wonder if you could tell us what your field is and how it relates to AI. So my field is computer graphics. I do research into how to make better pictures, but I have PhD students who are using AI in manipulating the research ideas. So I've been dabbling in AI for several years. And over the last six months, as somebody who teaches at university, I've become very exercised by the challenge that ChatGPT poses to both how we teach and how we assess students. What exactly is AI? So AI is a broad term that describes any computer system that's developed in an attempt to mimic human or animal intelligence. So in the early days, we hand coded things the way we thought humans worked. So very logical systems such as the early chess playing computers. But today we are much more working with neural networks, which is a network of artificial neurons encoded in the computer that tries to mimic the way the human brain works by having many, many layers of neurons connected with thousands of connections. And those connections change as our neural network is trained. And we had a real breakthrough about 15 years ago when we finally worked out how you train a neural network. So we train our neural networks on millions and millions of examples artificially. You feed it your input, for example, a photograph of an animal, and the neural network is supposed to output what animals in the photograph. So it might say dog or cat or goat. And when you set this thing up initially, it's just guessing. It's pure guesswork. But you tell it what the correct answer would be. And it, if it gets it right, it retunes the network to give a slightly better answer next time. And if it gets it wrong, it retunes it to say, mm, this input is not that output. And over millions and millions of trials, it gradually trains itself. So that when you eventually give it something it's never seen before, it can get the answer right pretty reliably, which is possibly how the human brain trains itself by repeated exposure to examples, you learn how to do things. The difference there, for example, is that my three-year-old daughter could recognize a cat after meeting two cats. She didn't need millions of cats to walk around in front of her before she could do things. So the human brain seems to have much more generality to it than we're getting in these neural network computer systems. So the most mind boggling thing is what ChatGPT is doing. So ChatGPT, as you know, has been in the news a lot recently. It's called a large language model. It's trained on billions of examples, including a very large number of books written by humans. So it's basically trained on text. And what it's been trained to do is given the previous several thousand words that it's seen, what's the next word going to be? There's a little bit more to it than that. There's actually been some human input in that. Part of its training was early on, once it had been trained up, it was producing outputs that really were pretty random. And they had a bunch of human beings putting in various prompts, seeing what came out and telling it which were the most likely things. But that was just titivating the training. So it's not intelligent. At its heart, it just puts one word after another based on the probabilities of what it's seen. What is really quite frightening, I think, is that it produces things that are really plausible, that you actually, I actually have to stop and think, but this thing's just putting one word after another, and yet it's producing a bunch of coherent sentences that make sense and make an argument that flows. And there is uh, quite a lot of argument amongst in the professional community about whether the neural network method is going to eventually lead to something that is truly intelligent, like a human being, or whether it's just a complete dead end. It's, it's a way of making cleverer and cleverer systems to do very well-defined tasks. So when you play with ChatGPT, it produces a sequence of words. It has no understanding of what those words mean. It has no understanding of whether what it's saying is true or not. But if there's enough data in its training set that gets it going on the right path, it can produce stunningly good output. Mm -hmm. We can equally get it to do stupid things. I asked it the other day, who was the first person to walk across the Cook Strait on foot? And it gave me a beautiful answer, explaining to me who'd been the first person to do this. And this was actually quite a challenging thing to do. Uh, the problem is it's not just a challenging thing to do. It's an impossible thing to do. Nobody's ever done and nobody ever will do it. But the answer was beautifully written. It's just, it was complete nonsense. So where are these systems going? The jury is out. Either the neural networks are, are simply a very clever piece of computer technology that allows us to do certain things better, um, like play chess or, or write better text, or they are a route by which we'll come to something which we call 
artificial general intelligence where the computer system can do the things a human being can do, which is react to unusual situations, to plan for the future and to think for itself and have emotions and feelings. Now, currently, we have not developed any computer system that does that, even if a system might hallucinate to you that it is doing that by simply giving you the answers that you expect to hear. So it sounds like you're saying we can interpret intelligence two ways. One is artificial intelligence, which is what we've got now. It's not real intelligence. It's not real understanding. It's artificial. But at some point, we might move over to the point where we want to say the computer actually is understanding, actually is intelligent. So those two things we call weak AI and strong AI. So weak AI is what we've built so far. Uh, the machine's doing something that looks clever, but it is just doing what it's been programmed to do and trained to do. So it's not even as clever as a cockroach. Strong AI is something we haven't yet built. That's something where a machine's able to demonstrate this artificial general intelligence, where it can respond appropriately and intelligently to novel situations in the way a human or a higher animal can. So how do you tell if something truly is intelligent? How do we tell if a computer's conscious? And it turns out there's, there's no reliable way to do that. I cannot test whether you, Chris, are conscious or not. You could be a perfectly intelligent human being, consciously responding to me in intelligent ways, or you could be a zombie, just responding totally instinctively to what I'm saying, but the instinct actually looks like intelligence because I impute that you must be an intelligent person and therefore I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. And that's what we're finding with tools like ChatGPT. Lots of people are assuming that there's an intelligence behind Behind what's going on that simply is not there. And because they've assumed there's intelligence there, they then interpret the output in a particular way. And that could get very dangerous if enough people believed that the computer that's not doing anything clever actually is conscious and intelligent and therefore started treating it like that. You could get all sorts of weirdness happening. Should we be worried about where things are going? Yes, well, um, I think we should be worried because things are changing at a rate that's way too rapid for human beings to keep up with. ChatGPT was released last year and the developments that have happened since it was released to now are quite phenomenal. We've been developing policy at the university to respond, for example, how do students declare how they've used these tools in writing a um, master's thesis? And the tools have changed enough in the last three months since we started doing this that the stuff we'd written three months ago is no longer relevant. This speed of development, how does a society cope? We don't know. If we do develop a strong AI, we're gonna have some real ethical and moral dilemmas. How would we as a human community treat this thing, which has got something that if it was human, we would treat with great respect? For example, I treat you with respect, Chris. I hope you believe that. But we also treat with respect uh, small children who have a very limited understanding of the world. And we treat with respect older people who have unfortunately got dementia. So in fact, as a Christian community, we have very strong views about how much you treat other human beings with respect. If you then have a machine that is conscious, how do you deal with that entity? Because one of the ways we currently deal with computers is they are our servants, they're our slaves, they do what we want. And as they're not conscious, we have no problems with that. How would we handle it if we had conscious machines? Now, this could be theoretical. We may never get to the point of developing conscious machines, but the Christian community has actually been there before. We've had debates about are animals conscious? How do you deal with animals if they are conscious? And even questions like, does an animal have a soul? But we've had those debates in the community for centuries. So we're a community that really does understand how to discuss these quite difficult philosophical questions. Now, much more concerning to me and much more likely is what happens with the current AI systems. These weak AI systems, they're not conscious, they're not intelligent, but they are really powerful. So these weak AI systems are leveraging our brains now. They are allowing us to do things that previously would have needed lots of human beings to do. And that could be really useful, good things, like we could, in a few years' time, have a private tutor for every child. And you know the advantage that kids get if they have a private human tutor. Imagine if you had a private computer tutor who could not only do the teaching, but also could, through facial recognition, through understanding tone and voice, actually 
get some idea of how the kid is feeling inside. Are they happy, sad, confused, bored? And tailor what they're doing to the child's current mood in the same way a human tutor would. That would be amazing. Imagine also have an AI system that could do medical diagnosis more reliably than a fallible human doctor. We get better diagnosis, people get treated sooner, and we're already seeing that. So there are enormous advantages to this. Mm. The disadvantages with any tool is that a tool that can be used for good, can be used for bad. And because these are such powerful tools, there's quite a lot of bad you can do. So already AI is uh, deciding how much you have to pay for your home insurance, tracking vehicle movements around your cities. In China, they're experimenting with not just tracking vehicle movements, but tracking human movements, tracking human behavior. Now imagine if you had uh, CCTV cameras, tracking on your computer or your web browsing history that could all feed into some central AI that could track what you were doing. We might think that's scary, and we might think that's something that only a, a bad regime would do, but I'm sure everybody listening to this call is using Google search engines, might be looking at things on YouTube, they're all tracking what you're doing and they're all making recommendations to you based on the history of what they've seen you do in the past. So we should be worried about how people will use these tools. Uh, I think the question of whether we're going to have intelligent computers is quite a separate question. Uh, we should be worried about how we use the computers we've got now. I wonder whether, as a Christian, whether you've got any more comments about how Christians should navigate AI issues and, and more, how, how Christians can contribute to a useful conversation about AI. Yes, I think there's, there's two ways. So, so first, the ones I've already talked about is if you want to debate about the meaning of personhood, uh, we've debated that for years in the church, and you could have uh, interesting theological and philosophical discussions about what, what it means to be a person. And we're really well placed as a church to contribute to that because we just have such a deep theological history. But the second way, I think the more important way, is that the church has a really strong ethos on the value and importance of human persons. We believe that all people are valued in the eyes of God, and we believe that all people are valued as our neighbours. So therefore, we've got much to say about the ethics and morality of how you use the weak AI systems. So we have a lot to say about what would constitute abuse, what would constitute good use. The church is a community that's used to having those sorts of debates. We also have firm foundations on which to base our arguments. So I think we as a community need to be prepared to think about, talk about, and and even fight about what's best to ensure that human beings are respected and have dignity. And that's not in the face of seeing a strong AI being developed, but in the face of other human beings who are using AI to further their commercial or their political ends. We need to be a voice that says human beings are intrinsically valuable. Let's not forget that.